But uh, excited to continue our agenda here, and we have a, a speaker that uh, I'm really excited for all of you to hear from. Uh, I had the chance to chat with him just in the hallway just now, and uh, welcoming Mark Nelson, the Vice Chairman of Executive and Executive Vice President of Strategy, Policy, and Development for Chevron. Uh, in that role, he uh, his, in his corporate responsibilities, he leads Chevron's strategy, sustainability, corporate affairs, corporate business development. Uh, within his 35 years of experience, he has served a number of leadership positions with increasing responsibility within the company in retail, marketing, operations, and business planning. And, and Mark, thanks for, thanks for joining us here today. Spencer, great to be here. So I, I guess uh, as you look kind of uh, down the agenda and, and look down the list of attendees at the organization, I, I don't mean to, to put you in a bit of a position here, but the, the name Chevron kind of jumps out a bit when, when you're looking at the speakers at a farm policy conference. But I understand that that's sort of because there's a bit of an increasing interest in farm policy within Chevron. Can you walk us through that? Well, we're participating this week because we want to support our nation's farmers and because we believe we can partner even better in the future. I, I have this general view that the agriculture industry and the energy industry can be taken for granted. Uh, they're, both, they're both industries that are absolutely vital to life today. Not just today, but in the future. In fact, I, I believe that both industries play a significant role in a lower carbon future as well. And, and Chevron's been partnering with farmers for decades. Um, you may not be aware, but we have produced lubricants for years and years and years that we sell for, for as tractor fluids and for large trucks called Adello heavy duty engine oil. So we've been providing that to farmers for years. We're actually uh, capturing fugitive methane from dairy farms and turning into what some call negative carbon renewable natural gas. And as you may all know, we have acquired Renewable Energy Group, and we are the second largest biodiesel, bio-based diesel producer in the United States and one of the biggest in the world. And now we're partnering on cover crops with some of the leaders in the industry. So we see a partnership here that's important to today and important to the future. Well, you mentioned the REG acquisition, and I wanted to kind of circle back on to that and just kind of get a status report of sorts, uh, if we could, from you. How has that tra uh, transaction gone, and and you know how how is the the merging of the two companies been going uh, in uh, in that transaction? Oh, it's it's fantastic. If you if you step back to think about why we acquired Renewable Energy Group, it was really to accelerate our production and supply of bio-based diesels today, be because it can be used in everything that everybody has today. So oftentimes, when people talk about lowering their carbon intensity. It talks about getting a new set of things. The concept of renewable fuels is that it can be a drop in fuel, it can be used in everything that everybody already has. And so this acquisition allowed us to accelerate our plans in that regard. And although we got biodiesel plants and we have a very large facility that's being expanded in Geismar, Louisiana to produce even more um, bio-based diesel, the, the most impressive part is the people. I mean, th these are people who have been working with farmers, have been working with seeds, have been working with other types of waste fuels to turn it into something over time. And when you combine that talent with the scientists we have at Chevron, it's just been, it's just been amazing. And the ability to get increased yields, so more out of what we're using um, and, and a, at a lower cost to the, to the consumer, it, it's just exciting to me. We've barely scratched the surface, but so far um, it's delivered everything that we hope for and more. Yeah, that, that transaction, that new relationship, really not all that old in the grand scheme of, uh, of Chevron's business, but you said it was something that was done to kind of accelerate your, your production timeline. I mean, can you walk us through what are, what are the possibilities now? As, as you get to know REG's, you know, you know, I guess former assets now, mm -hmm. uh, as you get to know those, what do you think are, are the production capabilities of a company like Chevron in this space? Well, so our, our philosophy was today we have, at, like many energy companies, we have uh, refineries today. And if you drive by a refinery today, they have long tubes that stand up in the air. Each one of those tubes can produce a, generally produce a certain type of product. As demand shifts over time at our company, we have the ability to transform at relatively low capital those individual tubes to pre be able to produce things like renewable diesel or sustainable aviation fuel. At the same time, we have these facilities that we've acquired from um, Renewable Energy Group that are, are built just to produce um, at very efficient, uh, in very efficient fashion, renewable diesel, and in some cases, sustainable aviation fuel. So we have uh, targeted capacity of 100,000 
barrels a day uh, in the next seven or so years. And today we have demand, we, we are struggling to keep up with demand. That's how excited customers are to use this. And it does two things for them. As I mentioned earlier, they can use the equipment that they have today, right? And they can, uh, they can essentially do it at a price that's equal to the same type of products they're buying today. They're a little bit higher carbon. Seems as if uh, every week, several times a week, actually, uh, some kind of uh, PR pitch will come into my inbox talking about uh, some new uh, project having to do with renewable diesel, with sustainable aviation fuel. There's a lot of excitement in this space. What does Chevron slash the, the Chevron REG partnership, what do you all see as kind of a, some part of the, your future in that space? Well, so our, our goal, from a Chevron's perspective, we have often, we've often said that we think the future of energy is lower carbon. And our role in that is to do the things, to use a, a phrase my children often use, to stay in your lane. We're trying to stay in our lane in regard to the things that we do well, right? And so the, the conversation of transportation fuels, we do transportation fuels very well. We've done carbon capture and storage, and we've done hydrogen in our past. So in our particular case, we're trying to leverage our skills in those areas to grow a lower carbon future. It's more than just the Renewable Energy Group acquisition. We also have a partnership with Bungie, where we're using their crops and their seed technology to expand the crushing capacity for the use in our own facilities to continue to produce renewable fuels over time. So we see continued growth, and we believe that we can be, you know, one of the continue to be one of the leaders in renewable fuel supply to the United States and perhaps beyond. One of the things that we're talking about kind of across our panels here today is uh, interest in the Farm Bill and, and legislation more broadly. So when you think about Chevron's renewable energy portfolio and you think about things that Capitol Hill can or, or should maybe do for you, what comes to mind? Well, there's parts of the Farm Bill that I'm sure I'm not qualified to speak on, but there are uh, three things come to mind f for me, and it's true for, first one's true for all business, and that's certainty. Every business performs better when they have a, a degree of certainty. So making sure that uh, the farmers of America have, a, have enough of that certainty to be able to be their very best, that would be number one. The second one is allowing everything to compete. We have a tendency today um, in, in governments to pick the answer versus letting the United States do what it's done very well, which is apply its ingenuity. So our belief is that all crops should participate to be feedstocks. All energy sources should compete for the lower carbon uh, space in, in the future. And then the final one is maybe the connection of regulation to legislation. So if you can't get the permits or the pathways, all the other stuff doesn't matter. You know, so the ability to get permits, the ability to get pathways approved, and it should be all of them. The concept that from a government perspective, people want to sit back and decide that, well, that, we like that pathway better than this pathway. That's not how you stimulate ingenuity. And my general view, if I look back over time, and I'm, I'm learning about your industry, but I think about yields in soybean and corn, you know, going up, what, 40 and 50% over the last 20 years. If I could do that at a refinery today, I'd be very, very happy. But there's, a, there's an ingenuity there that I think we can unlock that uh, we haven't yet seen. You know, we have seen investments from, you know, oil and traditional petroleum companies in the renewable space before. You just mentioned there that you're still learning a little bit about uh, about production agriculture and some of the things that are there. In your conversations with, you know, some of your uh, oil industry colleagues, what do you think there is for that industry to learn about the renewable space and in turn production agriculture? Where are the knowledge gaps that you think uh, perhaps energy and agriculture could work together to close? Well, as I mentioned earlier, there, there are some areas of similarity, meaning we both industries can be taken, taken for granted. Uh, both industries deal with commodity cycles and have things that impact their margins that are outside of their control. The areas where I see the opportunity, uh, the opportunity to uh, partner even better is crop utilization, you know, the, the, the idea of soil management and money into seed technologies and the research that can allow those types of things to be even higher yield and available for all the many uses that they apply today. When we, I'll just use the Renewable Energy Group, Bungie, and Chevron scientists. When they get all together, some of the concepts that have come out for cover crops, as an example, and seed technology are things that I, I would have never imagined before. And I think, again, I, I we're just scratching the surface in that regard. So if you're scratching the surface, what's possible? Well, so think, think about the ability to um, essentially add a crop without having to change planting patterns and cover your sustainable aviation fuel for the next decade. 
that would, that would be good for the agriculture industry, that would be good for the United States, and I believe that type of potential is out there. So uh, before, we, uh, before we wrap up, we do have time for one question, and I uh, want to go ahead and ask that. The uh, it, question is, is the push to renewable liquid fuels for vehicles and airplanes pushed by federal policy or state policy? And is there more interest more in soybeans or canola acres? I'm impressed that you can read that from here. I can't, <laughs> I can't read that. Um, I, if the, is it pushed by state and federal? I think in the United States it's both, depending on which, which state we're talking about today. And from our perspective, we've been able to run both canola and soybean in our facilities today. And what we would be looking for is the best yield and you know, money to the farmer and yield for the production of renewable fuels. And at any given time, it can be either of those two things. So we're supportive of both. Well, I think we're, we're coming up on time here, but uh, I do cer certainly want to say appreciate the time to, to sit here and chat with you. And folks, please join me in thanking Mark.